Everybody, uh, please stand for this first song. This is uh, we did this last week, but um, this was a, this was a song Toby asked us to to learn, and uh, we couldn't help ourselves but do it again to remember him. And and this is this is really the the story of what it's like to get into the be in God's kingdom. Is that it has nothing to do with what we do. That the Jews followed the letter of the law to human perfection, and it was as filthy rags to God. And it's not because that we've brought anything ourselves, but because we've accepted his gift and his mercy that, that we are able to enter into the kingdom of God. This heart of stone Made up my own mind To change my own life Working my own way to work As if anybody can But the truth is I've been broken Since my very first day And the truth is I've been wrong Since my very first day I know the only reason I could stand here on a shame. It's not because I'm worthy. It's not because of mercy. There's no way I could earn it. Praise God, my dad is me. It's not because I'm worthy. It's not because of mercy. Your blood and died, bring this dead man back to life. I know the only reason I can stand here on a shame. It's not because I'm worthy, it's all because of mercy. There's no way that I could own it. Praise God, my dad is pain. It's not because I'm worthy, it's all because of mercy. I know the only reason. I can stand here on a shame. It's not because I'm worthy. It's all because of mercy. There's no way that I can own it. Praise God, my dad is pain. It's not because I'm worthy. It's all because of mercy. Before you know as I was back then If I ever should forget Remind me once again Just as desperate for you now As I was back then If I ever should forget Remind me once again I know you know my music I can stand here on the chain
to have a seat if you want. Toby is experiencing this right now as he's walked into the kingdom of God. And Jim, 
what it's going to be like when we get caught up in the presence of God. His presence is here with us. We know that. And wherever two or three are gathered, he's there in the midst. But when we get there, it's going to be so beautiful, so much wonderful, so wonderful. I just want to sit here at your feet I'm 
great and greatly to be praised and we worship you and we praise you and we glorify you for all that you've done in our lives for your blessings your mercy when things don't go the way that we want it to that you still have a plan and that you have foreseen it and you have allowed it we don't know what that is we don't understand it we may be angry but lord you are just and you're true and that you have you are fulfilling your word in our lives and your plan in our in our midst and we thank you and we praise you in jesus mighty name let's take a couple minutes to greet each other All righty, make our way back to our seats. We'll get started here tonight. What a blessing to see you guys here tonight. Um, <clears throat> I am just going to share a little bit out of uh, Psalm 119 uh, tonight. Uh, and next week we're going to pick up uh, back in Numbers chapter 31 as we're going verse by verse through the book of Numbers, through the whole Bible. Uh, but we're going to resume the normal study um, next week in Numbers chapter 31, and uh, for the couple visitors that we have here tonight, um, we had our worship leader, longtime worship leader, 12 years, uh, enter into glory this last uh, Saturday. So we're still kind of uh, rejoicing, but also, uh, you know, missing him and things like that. And I've been working a lot with the family, Jesse and Olivia, um, this last week. Uh, they asked me to be a pallbearer, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then we're going to be doing the service for Toby, Celebration of Life. will be uh, October 6th, so it's going to be a Sunday. Uh, the time is still to be determined, but they're thinking at 3. I think they're still trying to get a hold of family from out of state and stuff. Um, uh, so the time is not 100%. They gave us 3 o'clock, but the date is... So it's going to be after church, normal church, that Sunday around 3 o'clock. And then that Monday they asked me to do the graveside, which that'll just be strictly family. Uh, the service on Saturday is welcome, of course, to all of us, church family. Um, and that'll be a blessing Sunday, I'm sorry. And then that Monday, the following day, will be the graveside, October 7th. Um, so keep them in prayer and thank you to everyone who... Uh, has been delivering meals. We've had a bunch of the ladies from the church, and David, actually, I shouldn't say ladies, because David um, are taking them a meal tonight, um, some good smoked meat. Um, so what a blessing, though, to come alongside the family, because they're having to do 
just a ton of little odds and ends where they're going, you know, through his house. And I mean, there's just so many things. If you've ever had a, had a loved one pass away in your life, you know what I mean. Um, there's so many little details. And so it's very nice during this time to come alongside the family and give them meals. And they really appreciate that. And you heard Jesse on Sunday. I thought that was pretty special for him. To, that wasn't planned. In fact, I didn't even know they were coming to the service uh, until about 9 o'clock or so. He messaged me and said he was going to be here. Uh, it's Toby's son. And um, so that was special. And I thought him coming up and, and thanking all of us, right? That's what I heard him say. He thanked us as a church for taking care of his dad were his exact words. Um, and just loving his dad. And uh, so that was really neat. And uh, I think Olivia is going to be doing some worship for the service. I would be shocked if she didn't, if she's able to hold it together. But um, that will be very special. Um, so join us again. That's going to be October 6th, uh, Sunday after church. Next Sunday will be the celebration of life. And then that Monday, uh, the family will be having the graveside as well. And so uh, tonight I just wanted to share out of Psalm 119 tonight and then... Really, the majority of the time, I apologize for the visitors. I apologize for not doing the normal verse by verse, but this has just been a complicated week, and uh, I think God has something special, though, for us through Psalm 119, but then I want to open it up uh, for a time of prayer. We try to do this every month, corporate prayer, and I have oil here. I know Rick asked for anointing with oil, so we're just going to... After the short little um, devotional I have and pray, then we'll open it up to individual prayer corporately, just one at a time, and just pray if somebody has a scripture they want to share or a word from the Lord. Uh, and then after that, if anyone wants special prayer um, to be anointed with oil, we can do that here tonight uh, as well, because that's what the Bible says. If you're sick, if you're hurting, if you're in need of prayer, by faith, come forward to the elders of the church, and by faith, the elders of the church are going to lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, and pray for you. And so we're both acting by faith, which, of course, we know is what activates the power of God. It's faith. And so by praying and laying hands on each other and anointing each other, we're expecting God to move. And so uh, we can do that here uh, tonight. So let's go ahead and open with prayer, and then we'll take a look at Psalm uh, 119. Father in heaven, I just uh, thank you, God, for your faithfulness, Lord, and for your goodness, and for your mercy, and for your grace, and uh, Lord, I just thank you that though no day is guaranteed, uh, you tell us that in your word, that no man knows the day or hour when they will be called home, but what we do know is that each day you do give us is a gift, and so we thank you, Father, for the breath of life that we've taken today, and Lord, maybe we're going through some difficult things. Uh, well, I pray that looking into your word, looking at you, uh, would remind us of the great strength that is available to us, the great comfort that is available to us, the great peace that is available to us. And it's through uh, you, Lord, and through your word that we can find these things. And so, Father, you know where each and every one of us are tonight. Maybe some of us come just rejoicing because there's just been a miraculous move in our lives, and so we want to praise you and worship you and thank you for that, and others come with problems and struggles and difficulties, and uh, Lord, we just lay all these things at your feet. We come to the one who has the power and uh, authority and ability to make these changes, to make a difference in our life, and so we just open ourselves up to you here tonight. We pray that you would have your way with us that we would surrender any fear, any doubt, um, anything that would be holding us back from giving whatever it is we need to give to you tonight, that we would give it to you freely. And Father, you would take it and you would use it, Lord, for your glory and for your honor. Lord, and that you would continue to just wash over us, Lord, and fill us, each one of us, with your Spirit. Anoint us from the tip of our head to the tip of our toes, Lord, and just return that joy of our salvation to us here tonight. And so bless all that goes on here. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, and so Psalm 119, I covered a little bit of this at the men's retreat a couple weeks ago. 
uh, because I love Psalm 119. Of course, the longest um, chapter in the Bible. And I don't think it's by mistake that it's the longest chapter in the Bible and the theme of it is the Word of God. God always putting the emphasis on His Word uh, and the importance of His Word because as we know, as Toby said very often, uh, God's Word is one of three things that will never be done away with. His Word is forever. Uh, His Word will never disappear. And so His Word is trustworthy. His Word is uh, faithful. Um, In His Word we can find so many things. And so let's look here. At Psalm 119, I'm just going to point out a couple verses through this and maybe highlight on some of them. But as you're reading through these, remember what we are reading. Uh, We're not reading some ancient words, though they are. Uh, We're reading words that are alive. Uh, The Bible tells us that the Word of God is alive, uh, and it's powerful, and it's able to separate Uh, The bone from the marrow, it's able to discern the intent and the thoughts of the heart. And so as we are reading these words, it's not me reading these words to you. Uh, We should be hearing these words of God that are coming and falling upon our hearts. And so we just, we want to hear these words coming from whose words they are. (laughs) And they're not mine. I'm just here to echo them to you. That's the easy job of the pastor. I don't have to create uh, my own material. God has given us the material. I just need to relay the material to you and let you um, hear and let the Spirit begin to work in our hearts. So the first verse I want to look at is verse 4. The psalmist David writes, You have ordained your precepts or your word that we should keep them diligently. Right? We always need to remember that, that God's word is what? It's God breathed. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that it is inspired by God. Though men wrote these words, uh, men did not originate these words. They didn't come from man. They came from God. It was God who gave them to men and men who penned them. So 2 Timothy 3.16 says that every word of God is inspired by God, or you may say God breathed. And so we need to remember that, that this is a, uh, a living book, right? And God's Word is alive and powerful. And so we're reminded that God's Word is ordained. It's ordained by God and that we should do what? We should keep them diligently, right? David would always say that he would lie on his bed at night and he would do what? He would meditate upon God's Word. When he would wake in the morning, what would he do? He would meditate upon God's Word, right? I think that even when we were looking through Numbers chapter 30, we see those two sacrifices that were made every day before the temple that were given as sacrifices unto God. And remember, there was one in the morning and one in the evening. That's the same picture, Right Before you go to sleep at night, we should be thinking about God. We should be praying and saying, God, thank you. Uh, Thank you for letting me get through another day. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. And get a good night's sleep. And then wake up in the morning and what do we pray? If you're anything like me, okay, God, here we go again. Right Here's another day. Your word says that uh, uh, your blessings are new. Your mercies are new each and every morning. So I have a whole new day here before me. you know. And everything in my past wants to keep dragging me back to that and keeping me miserable and, and in fear and in chains. So Father, forgive me, Lord, where I have fallen. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Wash me. And do what? Show me that your mercies are new each and every morning. And let me draw closer to you today than I did yesterday. And Lord, I need your help. And there's a lot of pitfalls out there today. There's a lot of uh, enemies that could be looking to harm me, right? Even though we don't know that and we're not aware of it. In the spiritual realm, remember, uh, you and I have targets on our backs. It's not just the pastor who has a target or the worship team who has a target. It's a Christian, any Christian. You have willfully chosen to make yourself an opponent to your adversary, the devil. And so there are these little pitfalls. There are these little snags. 
And that's why the Bible says that God's word is what? A lamp unto our feet. The word is able to illuminate uh, these pitfalls, these traps. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, The word of God shows us the direction that we should go. And it illuminates danger uh, for us. And so verse 4 again, that his word is ordained and we need to diligently keep his word. Look at verse 11. David says, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. You know, maybe you need to think tonight, like I did earlier. What is it that you're treasuring in your heart? Uh, Everyone has something. Uh, Maybe they've never even verbally expressed it to anyone. Uh, Maybe because they're ashamed or afraid to. But I just ask you, you know, really search your heart and ask yourself, what is it that I really treasure? Uh, What is it that really brings me the most joy, the most peace, the most security, the most comfort? What is it that I really treasure? What am I willing to throw everything else off for to go after? Uh, Because really, that's what a picture of a treasure is. Has anyone been on like a scavenger hunt or a treasure hunt when you were a kid? Right, That anticipation of finding that treasure, uh, you could go on for hours, you know, if not days when you're a little kid looking for that treasure. Why? Because that's all you're consumed with. You want that treasure. Well, God would say that hopefully he is that treasure to us, that God has become that treasure. Maybe some of us, our treasure was money. Maybe we thought that that chasing after that almighty dollar would, you know, uh, open up doors and, and make a life full of, you know, ease and this and that. And, you know, some of us have never attained to that to find out if it's true or not. But um, we know that money has wings. No matter how much of it you have or how little you have, money has wings, especially in 2024. Uh, your dollar does not go as far as it did even three or four years ago. Um, so many people treasure uh, money. Uh, Many people treasure beauty uh, or health or um, strength, you know, or um, your uh, job, your your title, your position. You find your identity in who people see you as. That's a treasure. Uh, That can be somebody's treasure. They like the admiration. They like the respect. Uh, You know, that used to be me, you know, when I worked for my brother-in-law and I didn't see it every day in me, but looking back, yeah, I was very proud. And and there's a good pride and there's not a good pride either. We should be uh, proud and confident in the things that we do, but not arrogant, right? And not finding my identity in my job and my title. But I liked being the boss. I liked having the big truck that was paid for by the company, that the company put gas in. And, you know, I, I liked the role of being the boss. I didn't always like all the work of being the boss, but I liked that image, right? And so that could be a treasure, right? Success uh, or these things. Well, the challenge to us as Christians is, is hopefully we found that whatever treasure we were chasing after, I believe the reason why we came to God is because we found those treasures weren't quite satisfying us or we never were able to attain to them or we attained to them and found that they left us wanting that they never did satisfy you know those are the things that Solomon found out right we read all about that in the book of Ecclesiastes a wonderful book really kind of a depressing book because it is it's just that it is the the life seen through a man who is trying to do anything and everything he could to find pleasure and, and to find happiness. And he went everywhere and did everything. And at the end of his life and his story, he said the best thing that a man or woman could do is fear God and keep his commandments. That's it. This is the guy who built vineyards and this and had, what, 2,000 or 1,000 wives. You know, like lust is going to, if lust is your treasure, look out. You're going to burn with lust, right? Ask Solomon, ask Samson. But whatever his treasure was, whatever his desire was, he said, I never kept anything from myself. Whatever I wanted to do, I did. And Solomon almost went mad if it wasn't for the grace of God. 
of God. But he said in the end, the best thing a man or woman can do is fear God, right, and keep his commandments. Why? Because his commandments are true. Uh, His commandments are life-giving. They're comforting. They're salvation. We're going to get to it here. There's salvation in the Word of God. That's the only way you and I were saved. Think about that. Your faith came through the hearing of what? God's Word. All of us. We came to faith through the hearing of God's Word. And so there is power in the Word of God. That's why I said Sunday, you know, I'm not here doing what I'm doing to try to uh, relay my philosophy to you, right? Or maybe the things that I figured out in life that seem to work for me, you know, that I'm going to make them, you know, stamp them, you know, with the Bible and, and say, hey, this is the word of God. You know, it'd be foolish. Uh, um, really, all I want to do is hold up, like I said on Sunday, hold up the word of God to you because the power is in the word of God not in my life story not in my wins and losses or my failures and my triumphs though those things are important right because it reminds us of just how we're very much alike we're all very similar I remember when I first got saved that was one of the things that drew me to Pastor David Rosales of Calvary Chapel Chino Valley because my idea of church was you know you know, the only church I knew was Christian Reform, and I had to wear like a suit, you know, as a kid, as like an eight-year-old kid, and they didn't have like playgrounds and stuff. You sat in the church, and and man, if I moved, you know, I'd kind of get smacked, like, you know, sit still, you know, and so my idea of church was just like, oh man, a bunch of stiffs, you know, and I'm like, I don't know, well, I don't want to go there. It's like discipline, Right, And so then I walked into a Calvary Chapel, you know, and of course I was seeking God at the time. When I was a kid, you know, I wasn't really seeking God. It was just, this is boring, I want to go home. Uh, but when you're really seeking God, you will find God. And, but that's what amazed me is, is David Rosales just sharing so intimately uh, about the Word of God, but even about himself. You know, being able to stand up there, because I saw the pastor as like this perfect man, right? I mean, he was the mouthpiece of God, and, and to hear him share about his struggles with alcohol, uh, and that he was an ex-drug addict, and sharing these things so openly, without being humiliated and shamed, I remember sitting there thinking, man, you know, everyone's like not getting up and running out, because this guy that's supposed to be leading him is telling him that he was like this hippie and drug addict, and... I was like, what is going on here, right? I mean, that is, to me, is refreshing. Not that we revel and boast in our sin, but boy, oh boy, when, when we can talk about it and, and show personally how the Word of God is changing and transforming our lives, that we're a lot more alike than we are different, really. Uh, we make ourselves different. We try to make ourselves different, but really we're so much more alike than we are uh, different. But God's word uh, does what? It should be a treasure to our heart because when we treasure God's word, there's the key in that verse, verse 11. When we're treasuring God in our heart, we will not sin. We will not sin. It's when we're not treasuring God in our heart that we're allowing something else to be more important in our heart. And guess what? It's going to be sin. Even if it's not an outright, blatant, harmful sin, it's still missing the mark. It's still missing the mark. It's not uh, coming to the place where God wants the best in your life. Right? I believe that. I believe in, in God's sovereign will, but I believe in a certain degree of permissive will as well. In other words, God uh, has plans for us that are this high, uh, but it is our fear. It is our lack of faith. It is our unbelief because God isn't going to force me to attain what he has for me. No, God wants me to, of my own free will, choose and partner and by faith trust him with these things. So I think that, because the Bible says that, Paul says that in Philippians, right? That we would know and fathom the height, the breadth, the depth, the width of God's great love for us and his plans for us. But it's just like the people of Israel, when God told them about the promised land. How it was what flowing with milk and honey and and the fruit, you know, and it's abundant and this and that. And God gave them everything they wanted. uh, And all they had to do is what? Go in and possess the land. And remember, they weren't able to do that. Why? Because they were afraid. 
they made excuses. Though God said, don't worry about the enemies. I'm going to drive them out. If I am with you, who could be against you? All of these things. And, and by the way, God proved himself along the way too. It's not like they just woke up one day from you know, underneath a, a rock and God said, you know, trust me, I'm going to give you the promised land. No, God did what? He brought these plagues from heaven upon Egypt and buried this nation and delivered them through the Red Sea. Right? Like, does anyone believe that story? Archaeologists do. Some of them do because there's artifacts. But God parted the Red Sea, led these million or so people through the Red Sea, and then closed the Red Sea again. Right? God had manna uh, come from heaven every morning, their food, their shoes, their clothes. It never wore out. I mean, amazing, amazing things. So God had proved himself all along the way. And then God says, oh, and by the way, now this is finally going to be home for you, right? This is going to be the place that I promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And you're going to go in and you're going to possess this land. And what did they do? Uh, no, we can't. The giants are too big. We're going to get squashed. We're too small. We're not warriors, right? You know, all those things that we battle with in our heads, when we read God's word and we read his promises and we say, well, yeah, that worked for them, but it's not going to work for me. It's the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing. So God has great plans and purposes for us, but he's not going to drag you through these promises. That's just not the character and nature of God. If you think God is going to drag you through this life, then you're not understanding who God is. God isn't going to drag you through anything. right? God is going to lead you. And maybe he'll even lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. But guess what? He even tells us, lo, I am always with you. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil. Why? Because the Lord is with you. He's not going to drag you. He's going to lead you. And you're going to want to follow him. The more we see God being faithful and his word being faithful, the more we are going to follow him. Look at verse uh, 28. The Bible says, My soul weeps because of grief. Oh, haven't we all been there? The devastating grief. Grief comes in many different ways. Uh, but your soul, when your soul is grieving, it's hard to sometimes, as I said before, it's hard to even get out of bed, to find the courage and the strength to face another day. Uh, I don't know how many times not of late, but in the, in the past, uh, laid in bed and felt such just a deep, dark uh, depression and, and grief state to where I was even just, I wanted to keep the covers over my head, right, and just stay there and not show up to work and not, you know, see my kids and wife and just stay under the covers. But what do you have to do? <laughs> you can't lay there. You got to get up out of bed. You got to get moving, uh, right, but grief, that's what David and David experienced a lot of grief himself. David had a crazy life. You can read all about that in First Samuel and in First Kings and other areas, but David knew what grief was. He says, My soul weeps. Notice not even like he just his eyes were weeping. It's like this deep grief that's coming from the soul. Yeah, the tears are coming from the eye, but He's weeping from the soul. But what does he say? Strengthen me. In those dark, dark times, David found strength where? According to your word. David's strength was found in God's word. God's word that is powerful. God's word that is true. And so you and I, when we're in that deep, deep grief, we have to find our strength, not mustering it up within ourselves, because sometimes, if you've ever been there, you don't have the strength. You don't have the strength. You can't, maybe you could muster it up before, you know, but this one's a little different. It's heavy. You can't muster it up. Guess what? That's a good place to be, because then you're forced to depend on God's strength. And God is faithful and he will strengthen you according to his word. Look at verse 38. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Oh, daily we need to read God's word for a lot of things, but if one is more important than the other, I would say this is 
the most important part about reading God's Word, that we never lose respect for God's Word. We never lose uh, um, the reverence for the Word of God. Sometimes we can begin to wander and, and ponder in our minds different things of life, and we can convince ourselves of all these different things, and maybe we feel like that little butterfly that's free and no concerns. Uh, but when we come back to the Word of God, the Word of God has a way of showing us that honesty mirror, doesn't it? We can convince ourselves and be deceived and deceive ourselves in many different ways, but when we come back to the Word of God, and the Word of God begins to reflect uh, the sin in our lives, it begins to reflect, reflect all of the imperfections in our life, the Word of God has a way of bringing reverence uh, into our lives, and we need to have the fear of the Lord, the reverence for uh, God, it's not so much the fear of God's judgment, because if we're Christians, uh, we are no longer under judgment, but it's the fear of being void from the presence of God. To me, that would be the most fearful thing. If God's favor and grace and his protection was somehow taken off of me, right, to not sense the presence of God, the presence of God would be a very fearful thing. So as Christians, that's our fear of the Lord. It's the fear of not having God in our lives because we've become so in love with God. It's like in a marriage, right? If you're really in love with your spouse and then all of a sudden your spouse leaves, you know, it's the same kind of picture. You're afraid. Uh, I don't know what I'd do without my wife. I, I'm afraid, you know, uh, my life would not be the same. My kids' lives wouldn't be the same, right? Well, how much more with God? Without God, I am nothing. Without God, I would be nothing. Without God, there is nothing, right? Because God is everything. Verse 41, may your loving kindness also come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. That's what I said. Faith, our salvation comes through the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the book of Hebrews tells us. Verse 49, remember the word to your servant in which you have made me hope. Oh man, maybe you're feeling hopeless. Well, guess what? In the word of God, when we treasure the word of God, when we treasure God and we look to his word, because the Bible says uh, that if we ask, we seek, we knock, we will find, uh, it will be open, it will be given to us. Right? So there's great hope when we return back to the Word of God. Has anyone else ever put their hope in something else other than the Word of God and come to find that sometimes God will even uh, jeopardize that thing that we've put all this hope in? Sometimes God will even knock it down to remind us that our hope should not be in those things. It only needs to be in Him, uh, in the One who is everlasting Right? It's like uh, the nation of Israel who used to build those little phony idols, right? the little wooden carved objects. And they'd put, uh, it's funny, they would create these idols to worship that looked exactly like them. Right? That just speaks to the human nature of men and women. We create gods in our own image and likeness, don't we? We want our God to be just like us, right? Because really, what are we doing? We're seeing ourselves in that little idol. And so God would say, hey, how foolish are you people? Um, you're putting all your hope and faith in a little wooden object that has eyes, but yet it cannot see. That has a mouth, but yet it cannot speak. It doesn't even possess life in itself, and you are asking this little object to save you. Right? How foolish is that? How nonsense is that, but yet we do the same thing today. They may not be little wooden carved images, but you can fill in the box. Uh, we all have worshipped or treasured uh, some sort of uh, image or idol in our life. But the Word of God says here, don't put your hope in those things that will be destroyed. Uh, put your hope in the one who is everlasting, the one who is eternal, uh, the one who who is the giver of life. Put your hope in that one. A couple more here. Verse 76 says, Oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word. 
to your servant. Oh, how much, how many times do I pour through the Psalms uh, when my soul is grieving and my soul is crying and I need strength, but I also need hope, but I also need comfort. Oh, there is no better place. In fact, there was one time when I did pull the covers over my head, but then what I thought to do was get my little light, right, and turn on my phone and read what? The Word of God under the covers. Uh, but what an amazing thing, because you can find great comfort in the Word of God. God knows how to comfort in ways that doesn't make sense. You know, to me, sometimes the comfort I can find through the Word of God, it shouldn't be right? Because if it's just a book, right? I mean, how can you find comfort in that? I need real comfort. I need somebody to hug me. I need somebody to hold me. I need something to change, right? That's the comfort I think I need. But yet somehow God has a way of comforting my soul, right? My very soul that is anguished within me. Because I'll tell you what, if your soul isn't being comforted, you're never going to find any comfort anywhere else. Once you are comforted in here, then you can find some sort of pleasure or comfort in other things. But God needs to be that first place because he's the only one that can truly comfort. Here's Toby's favorite verse, Psalm 89. Bob, you should have this one memorized. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And so what gives us the right to think that we can change God's word. God's word is settled in heaven, not just on earth. It's settled in heaven. So angels aren't changing the word of God. Nobody changes the word of God, yet little old man here who really is nothing but dust. <laughs> I have to be careful when I say that and take a little pause because uh, we don't want to say but dust. <laughs> but man is just but dust, and yet what do we think? Right? We think somehow we can add to God's word or take away from God's word or change God's word or distort God's word when the Bible says that even in the throne, right before the throne of God, his word is settled. It will never change. Just kind of eye-opening. Verse 97 says, Oh, how I love your law or your word. It is in my meditation all the day. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Verse 105, here it is, one of my favorites. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Verse 122, be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fill with longing for your salvation, and for your righteous word. Beautiful. Verse 130, the unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I love that, the unfolding of your word. The revelation of your word, the understanding of your word does what gives light. Because really, if we just read the words, and just let them go in one ear and out the other ear, it really doesn't have any effect in our life, does it? But when we begin to do what? Allow the word to unfold. It becomes a light. And what do we do? We begin to apply those words to our life. And really it becomes great wisdom, right? Wisdom is different than knowledge. Knowledge is knowing what to do. Wisdom is knowing what to do. And then guess what? Doing it. Right, That's what makes you wise. Just rattling off God's word doesn't make you wise. It's doing God's word that makes you wise. Yet, what do we think? What did the religious leaders think? Right, The more profound their words were, the wiser they would you know, appear. But it's not in repeating God's wisdom. It's in applying God's wisdom. You know, what a beautiful thing. Two more here, and then we'll pray. But I you know, challenge you, even tonight or tomorrow, read through this whole chapter. Take some time and meditate upon it. It's very powerful. Verse 154 says, Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Do you need to be revived? Well, guess what? The word of God has a way of reviving us. And God's word will 
revive us. Verse 161, princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I love that verse. My heart stands in awe of your words. Though what? Princes persecute me without cause. Do you feel like you're being unjustly persecuted? Well, guess what? David felt unjustly persecuted. And what did he say? That his heart stands in awe of God's word. He says in verse 162, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil, right? Like that kid at Christmas when there's that big old present that mom and dad got, you know, and it's under the tree and you can't, if you're anything like me, couldn't sleep, you know, and mom and dad would bring it out two weeks before Christmas too, right? And for two weeks, I'd have to look at that thing and wonder and lay in bed and couldn't sleep and wonder what it was. Even one year, God is bold enough to go behind the very back of it and try to tear a little piece to see, get a little peek. Why? Because, man, I wanted to know what was in there. It was just, I couldn't rest. Well, David is saying right here, you know, be in awe. Let your heart be in awe of the word of God. Do we look to God's word that way as the great treasure that it is that will unfold before us? Well, that is what we need to begin to see. 169 says, let me cry, let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to to your word great understanding you know i've said it often that if you even if you weren't a christian even if you weren't born again uh, but you read the book of proverbs and you actually applied the wisdom through that book you would have tremendous uh understanding and tremendous wisdom uh, just because the book of proverbs is so profound there's great wisdom and there's great understanding in the word of god Verse 170, my supplication comes before you. Deliver me according to your word. I love that. Verse 171, let my lips utter praise for you teach me your statues. Let my tongue sing of your word for all your commandments are righteous. Let my tongue sing for your word. Isn't it amazing that all of our worship songs in the church, churches, the big, greater church, what are we singing about? I would say most of the older songs anyways, a lot of the Calvary songs, but a lot of the older hymns, what are they? God's word. (laughs) It's just scripture, right? Singing God's word. But even our songs, you know, all of our songs are glorifying uh, to God. Right, Sing praises of his word, his word that is true and faithful. And so I just pray that if nothing else, just a little bit of our uh, taste. Uh, what did the Bible just say? That God's word is sweet. It's sweeter uh, than honey. So I pray that your palate would be you know, enticed here tonight to just uh, keep looking into God's word, keep searching God's word, keep trusting him especially as we transition through a very difficult time, right? I mean, moving forward with, you know, a brother who's, uh, he's, not, he's not disappointed right now, I guarantee you that. That's what Jeff and I were just talking about. You know, we don't need to worry about Toby not being, uh, you know, just fine. I guarantee you as much as he loves us and his family, he would not come back. He would not want to come back. He's in a better place. But, just like in any family, you know, you still miss the, like that last Sunday, it was weird. And God, God still is just ministering in little ways. I'll just share this. But the routine for 12 years, well, now I've been preaching eight years. So for eight years, you know, I'm, I'm over here in the morning uh, praying and combing through my notes. And usually I know right about five till ten the door opens and it's Toby, right? And he's always there and he's got his little song list and he's always, you know, dressed for his Sunday best. And, you know, he'd always say, hey, good morning, Pastor. I've been praying for you. You know, he always would say that. I've been praying for you, you know. Sometimes he'd even come over, you know, and, and he'd pray uh, with me and then he'd come in and do his, his normal thing. Well, 
you know, I was just there, and then it was about five till, you know, and, and I'm not even thinking about any of that. I'm just going through my notes trying to get myself together because I'm like, this is going to be hard, right? I mean, I just found out the day before that he went away, you know, he went into heaven, and now I got his family that's going to be here, and I got to somehow preach the word of God and hold it together. I'm like, ah. and the door opens, and just out of sheer instinct and, and, you know, routine, I just looked over expecting to see Toby. But guess who it was? His son. <laughs> right? And I, I, even I went home and I told Melissa that. And she's like, are you serious? And I'm like, I don't know what God was trying to, you know, minister me there. Or if anything. But I was just like, you know, I was like disappointed but elated at the same time. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's not Toby, but wow, it's his son. You know I mean? Praise God to that. But. But anyways, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna miss those and those little things, you know, and and but uh, those are good memories, you know. That's why I've been trying to encourage the family with a little bit, you know. He's not gone, right? I mean, he's in heaven, but he's always gonna be a part of our lives, right? We have the stories, we have the memories, and so I. That's what a celebration of life is. We're celebrating uh, the times we had together, and so you know. But anyways. Uh, let's close with prayer, and then um, if anyone does need prayer, just stick around after the corporate prayer. Um, if you don't want to pray, I always say this, you don't need to pray. If you need to leave, leave. Uh, but if you want to pray, pray. If you want to read a scripture, whatever we want to do. Um, and, but at the end, if there is somebody, I know Rick asked earlier if I could anoint him with oil, and so that's why I have my oil. If anyone else wants to come up for prayer or anointing with oil or anything like that, um, I'm here. Uh, Rick can can help with that too. Brent's back there, so uh, Nathan. So there's people here who would uh, love to pray uh, with you and for you. So let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, I just thank you, uh, God, for tonight, Lord, and I thank you for each and every one, Father, who comes. As I said at the beginning, you know, with we all come from different places in our walk, and we're all in different parts of our journey, Lord. Some of us are climbing the hill some of us are kind of on a plateau and some of us are coming down the hill and so i just pray that wherever we're at god that um, you would be there in our midst we would be uh, asking seeking and knocking looking to you lord for uh, everything that we just talked about tonight for our strength for our comfort for our hope for our understanding for our peace for our joy and lord we would just continue to find comfort in one another too i love that uh, sometimes I can't feel the arms of God, but I can feel them through my brother or my sister. It's a beautiful thing to have each other, to uh, have compassion and empathy uh, for and upon. And the Bible even says that sometimes our grieving and God allows us to grieve. Well, first of all, so we can understand the heart of God that is always grieving, but so that when we are restored and we are comforted, uh, then the Bible would tell us now take that and share that with a brother or sister who is in need, who is hurting, uh, that you can now come alongside and comfort those who need to be comforted because you have been comforted. And so, Father, I thank you for the intricacies of the body, Lord, and how we all need to do our part, Lord. The thumb needs to be the thumb, and the wrist needs to be the wrist, and the elbow needs to be the elbow, and uh, the eye needs to be the eye, and the ear needs to be the ear. And thank you how you have strategically placed all of us here in this body with different gifts and abilities and uh, insights and all these things to just fit us together to function hopefully properly as a body and a healthy body and uh, to take care of one another and um, all these things God and so Lord as we now take this time to worship you through prayer and uh, these requests that we lift before you in these scriptures, God, we just pray uh, that you would continue to be in our midst, Lord, and that these words would just continue to rise before your throne, Lord, you would be pleased with your people here tonight, and Lord, that you would honor, Lord, and you would uh, respond to these requests and these words, Lord, as uh, we're coming to you by faith, and we know that you are a God who uh, hears his people and who cares for his people and so we just invite you to move freely lord amongst us to touch us lord how you see fit lord we pray for healing we pray for uh, lord any darkness that is overwhelming us that it would be lifted lord because we know stronger is he who is in us than he who is in the world and 
Uh, Lord, at the sound of your voice, at the sound of your words, that darkness flees, God. And so may we repel uh, the evil one, Lord, in anyone's life who's uh, being under attack. And these attacks are constant, so we should always be praying for that. Ephesians 5 and 6 tells us that, uh, that we need to put on the full armor of God when every single day. And so, Father, equip your saints, Lord, and uh, bless your people. Continue to watch over us and protect us. And thank you for the great favor and grace that you continually bestow upon us and for the great mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ that we are robed in your righteousness, that I don't have to stand upon my own good works, that I can stand upon the finished work that you did there on the cross that you accomplished on the cross and rose from the dead that is my righteousness and everything you have done and so thank you lord for salvation and and thank you for everything you're going to continue to do so bless this time now we love you and we praise you in jesus name amen